All right, welcome to Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 to 27. The title of this teaching is called Destroy Yourself Now, Save Yourself Later. Destroy yourself now in this life, save yourself later on in the next life, and that will be specifically at the Bema seat of Christ right before we go into the Millennial Kingdom. And I'll talk a little bit about that eschatology when the time comes. Um, I have a bad habit of promising that I'm going to talk about certain things in my teaching and then I just never touch on it. I need to like work on that habit, but I will try to mention it when we get there. So why don't we open our Bibles to Matthew 16, and why don't we read the text? So this is right after Peter has a blunder. He tries to talk Jesus out of getting crucified. Jesus rebukes him. Then Jesus says, you're thinking on the things of men, not the things of God. And then Jesus seems to use that as a reason to teach them this lesson. And I'm actually not reading the whole text. There's one more verse in chapter 16. He says something else, but I want to save that for the next teaching. And so we're going to read verses 24 to 27. It reads, Then Jesus said to his students, If anyone is wanting to come behind me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and be following me. For whoever wants to save his soul will destroy it, but whoever destroys his soul for my sake will find it. For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Or what will a man give as a trade for his soul? For the Son of Man is about to be coming into the glory of his Father with his messengers, and he will re recompense each according to his practice. All right, there ends our reading. Well, these are pretty uncomfortable and unwelcoming words to hear. It's um, a lesson on how there is suffering involved in being a disciple of Christ. There is hurt. There's pain. There's uh, fractured relationships as you follow Christ. There's persecution. Different Christians will get different levels of persecution, and I think that's largely just based on the sovereignty of God. I think some Christians are appointed to just a really high level of persecution, and others aren't. Although we'll talk a little bit about this as we move forward, but See, I'm doing it again. I'm promising to talk about something, and I may not talk about it later. But this, there's a passage here that talks about how sometimes Christians avoid suffering, but they're sinning while they do that to avoid persecution. So I think sometimes um, we sinfully avoid persecution. Well, I want to lay a little bit of groundwork before we dive into the text. And I'm trying to help us avoid a very common mistake with this passage, and that is the mistake of making this an evangelical scripture. And this is a really, really, really super common um, uh, strategy for evangelism. They go to this passage and they say, see, this is how you save your soul. You have to pick up your cross. You have to follow Christ, deny yourself. You have to destroy yourself. And then and only then will you be saved. And they mean that's how you go to heaven. That's how you get the Holy Spirit. That's how you get forgiveness for the penalty of sin. You have to pick up your cross and follow Jesus. And what you need to understand is denying yourself, picking up your cross, and following Jesus, all of those things are works. We're commanded to do these works. They're very good works. 
but they are works and they're not what merits salvation. So this is not synonymous with believing the gospel. John in his gospel in chapter 20 says these have been written so that you may be believing that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing, you may have life in his name. So you get life when you believe that Jesus is the Son of God. You believe he's a distinct person from God the Father, but of the same essence as him. You believe Jesus is true deity, become man, and that you also believe he's the Christ. That's another term for Messiah. You believe he's the promised king who will rule the world one day, and he will do that at his second coming. Right now, we're between the first and second coming of the Messiah. In his first coming, he uh, made it a point not to set up his kingdom and rule the world. He made it a point to live a, a normal human, uh, you might say Jewish life, perfectly, and then die for our sins, giving us that perfect record of righteousness, and then taking our sins at the cross and letting his own creatures torture and kill him, and then gloriously rising from the dead, just as he predicted. So we're saved by believing alone. And I think a couple of people wrongly use this passage as an evangelical passage. So let me explain why I think this is not an issue of eternal salvation. So let me lay a little bit of groundwork here. First of all, I think there's a difference between a, be a believer and a disciple. In this translation, it's the word student. Now notice in verse 24, he says, Then Jesus said to his students or disciples, and then he says, if anyone is wanting to come behind me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and be following me. In other words, I don't think Jesus is telling us what a believer must do to believe. I think what he's saying is this is what a disciple must do to be a disciple. And in Greek, the word believer is a different Greek word than the word for disciple or student. And once upon a time, I said that. I said, there's a difference between these two words. And someone got pretty upset about that. And I think they realized where I was going in my logic. And so they rebuttaled that, no, they're not. They're the same exact Thing. They, they would argue they were it was a synonymous thing, believer and disciple. Well, if you just read through the New Testament from Matthew to Revelation, uh, you'll see that they're not used interchangeably. There's obviously a lot of overlap with them. Every believer should be a student, but they're not exactly the same thing. On one occasion, Judas is called a disciple, but Judas is not a believer. So this is a text that tells us what disciples must do, not what it takes to believe on the Lord for salvation, or maybe I should say eternal salvation. So that's the first thing I wanted to mention as we lay some groundwork before diving into the text. There's a difference between a believer and a disciple, and this is about discipleship, not believing on the Lord for eternal life. The second thing I want to talk about is what some people call the three tenses of salvation. This is another one of those distinctions that I think is important to make. In the Bible, you want to avoid making a distinction where the Bible does not, and you also don't want to make the other mistake. You don't want to see two things as exactly the same thing when the Bible does make a distinction between them. So just for an example, 
a lot of Christians make a distinction between the office of prophet and the gift of prophecy, or sometimes they'll make a distinction between Old Testament prophets and New Testament prophets, and usually that leads into the argument that the gift of prophecy is around today. And they argue that the gift of prophecy is like a lesser form of the office of prophet. I would say that's an unbiblical distinction. You're making a distinction where you shouldn't make one. And I don't think there's evidence in the Bible that tells us those are two different things. I think they're one and the same. To have the gift of prophecy is to be a prophet and vice versa. So that would be an example of don't make this distinction because the Bible doesn't. And then you have it the other way around. For example, the word fear when it's talking about God, like fearing the Lord or fearing God. You want to make a distinction here between being afraid of God and respecting God or taking God seriously. And you'll see in the Bible, it's the same word for fear. I think it's phobos in Greek. But there will be verses like in 1 John that says, we really shouldn't have a fear of God that he's going to hurt us. But then, then there's other places of scripture where it says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So it's like, should we have fear or not have fear? Well, that tells us there must be at least two definitions of the word for the word fear. And so there's a sense in which we should not fear God. As believers, we should not fear that he's going to punish us for our sins. We can say he'll discipline us and he'll have us go through trials, but we cannot say he will you know, punitively dish out judicious judgment on our sins. Um, he's our father and we're his children. But we should have a respect for God or we should take him seriously, right? We shouldn't just brush him off or disrespect him. So there's times when you got to make distinctions and there's times when you shouldn't. And you have to kind of use your... Um, sanctified mind along with the Holy Spirit to make these distinctions in the scripture. Well, I'm going to make a distinction here. And it's one that a lot of Christians do not make. Today, a lot of Christians use the word saved to talk about going from dead in your sins to alive in Christ, to talk about going from you were a child of Satan and an object of wrath, but now you're a child of God and you're beloved and you didn't have the Holy Spirit, but now the Holy Spirit's in you. They use saved only to refer to that. The Bible does use the word saved to talk about that. Um, for example, with the Philippian jailer in Acts 16, he says, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they say to him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved, you and your household. So saved is used that way. However, the word saved is used other ways too. And so I want to talk about what's called the three tenses of salvation. And what this teaches us is the word saved or salvation, it's used three different ways in the Bible. It talks about, in the first way, it talks about us being saved from the penalty of sin. Secondly, it talks about us being saved from the power of sin. And thirdly, it talks about us being saved from the presence of sin. So we'll just take me for, for an example. So I believe what I need to believe in order to be saved from the penalty of sin. So I believe the gospel in Romans chapter 1, 1 through 4. I believe Jesus is the eternal son of God become man. I believe he is the Messiah 
I believe he died for my sins. I believe he rose from the dead. I think Jesus is alive right now in a physical body at the right of the Father. He's going to come back. In um, Romans chapter 1, if you keep reading, but it says, it, like it, it's, it's for salvation for everyone who believes. So I am saved from the penalty of sin. However, in that second sense of the word, I am not necessarily saved from the power of sin. It is possible for me to still sin and reap consequences for it. So we learn about that in a place like Galatians 5, where it says, if you sow to the flesh, you will reap corruption. So it's possible for me to I can't go to hell. The Bible teaches once saved, always saved. I can't go to hell, but I can damage myself with sin. I can damage other people. I can damage relationships. Um, and, and in this sense, I can very, in a very real sense, destroy myself. I can destroy my soul with sin, even though I'm a believer. So I still need to be saved from the power of sin. But once I'm dead, or when the Lord returns and I get a glorified body, I will be saved from the presence of sin. And that's the final tense of salvation, when we are glorified and there is nothing, there's no presence of sin. We'll be saved from the presence of sin. All right, so let me show you some scripture that shows we should ha we should make this distinction. So you might be sitting there thinking, well, does the Bible really use the word saved that way? Let me show you some verses. Go to Matthew 14 and verse 30. We actually covered this verse earlier in our series. So this is when Jesus is walking on the water and Peter wants to come out. So Peter's walking on the water, but then he starts to drown. And it says in verse 30, but seeing the strong wind, Peter feared. And having begun to sink, he cried out saying, Lord, save me. Well, obviously Peter's not saying, save me from going to hell. Save me from the penalty of sin. Save me from the wrath of God. He's saying, save me from drowning. So the word saved here, it can be used to talk about physical salvation, being saved or rescued out of a... Um, situation where you might die. Okay, let me show you another one that's also physical. Go to James 5. Uh, this is a really, really, really common way the Bible uses the word save. It talks about being physically healed from an illness. This is really, the Bible uses save this way all the time. This is James chapter 5 and verse 13, <clears throat> or let's start in verse 14. Is any among you sick? Let him call on the elders of the assembly and let them pray over him, having anointed him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of the faith will save the ill, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he may have committed a sin, it will be forgiven him. So I think this is talking about believers. This is um, a letter that's addressed to believers, and I wish I had a little bit more time to develop that. Um, some people argue that is not the case because at the beginning of the book of James, it says it's written to the dispersion, which is basically the Jews who are not in the promised land, but he is writing to believers. If you just read through the book of James, he calls them brethren. He calls them beloved. At one point, he says the spirit is in them, even though they're acting as enemies of God. So it's really clear if you look for it there in the text, he's talking to believers. So this is someone who is saved, but they have sinned, some kind of sin. And now they have the opportunity to go to the elders um, because God has made them sick because of this illness or uh, because of their sin. And the elders can pray for that person and they'll be saved, but not saved from hell, saved from a temporal illness. Okay, now here's where maybe things get a little more complicated. 
The word saved can also refer, refer to a spiritual salvation, but it's not talking about a salvation from hell, but it is a spiritual salvation. So let me show you a couple of verses that talk that way. So go to 1 Timothy chapter 4. <clears throat> 1 Timothy chapter 4 and take a look at verse 16. Be taking heed to yourself and to the teaching. Be remaining in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those hearing you. So this is a letter written to a man named Timothy. Timothy is a Bible teacher. I think he was a pastor, but he definitely taught the Bible. And what Paul is saying here is, you need to keep a very close eye on yourself. Watch your motivations. Watch your imagination. Watch your anger levels. Like Keep an eye on yourself here and keep an eye on your doctrine, the way you teach. Make sure you're teaching the Trinity and teaching a bodily resurrection from the dead and teaching the inerrancy of Scripture and, um, you know, you're agreeing on every moral issue with the Bible. Keep an eye on your teaching. Be remaining in them. And then it says, in doing this, you will save, you will save both yourself and your hearers. <clears throat> Timothy is saved already when he receives this letter. Paul believes that Timothy is born again, right? If you go back to uh, the first verse of the letter, or maybe the second verse of the letter, it says, To Timothy, genuine child in belief. And you can read the whole letter if you want, but Paul obviously believes that Timothy is a Christian. Timothy is a Born again, child of God who is heaven bound. He'll never go to hell. However, Timothy still needs to be saved from the temptations and traps that are down here on earth. Even though he's born again, he still has physical flesh that is still fallen and contains that sin infection. Some people call it the sin nature or the sin principle, which is in every born again Christian until he dies or the Lord returns. And in this case, <clears throat> um, Timothy needs to be saved from succumbing to false teaching. And he's saying one of the ways you can be spared from becoming a victim of false teaching is by keeping a very, very close eye on yourself and your own doctrine. Just make sure you're teaching things straight and keep doing that. Remain in it. And you'll also save your congregation. Obviously, we don't save ourselves and we don't save other people. This is talking about salvation in a different sense. And it is a spiritual salvation, right? We're not talking about you're being physically rescued from danger, it's saying your soul can be damaged by false teaching and you want to spare yourself from that. And here's how you do it. So here's an example of how the word saved is being used in that middle tense, that second tense. We need to be saved from the power of sin, but we're already saved from the penalty of sin. In the same book, go back to chapter 2. This is a really debated verse, but I don't think anyone should disagree with what I'm going to tell you. In 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 15, this is talking about how women are forbidden from being pastors. And then there's an explanation as to why. And then we get this conclusive verse. It says in verse 15, but she, it's referring to Eve, but it's just talking about all women. But she will be saved 
through the bearing of children if they, women, should continue in belief in devotion in holiness with sound thinking. Well, this, this is not talking about being saved from the penalty of sin. And the reason I would say that is because these aren't the things you do to be saved from the penalty of sin. You're saved from the penalty of sin by simply believing the gospel as presented in places like Romans 1, 1 through 4, or 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 8, 2 Timothy 2, 8, Acts chapter 10, I forget the verses, but Peter gives a gospel presentation to Cornelius, or in Acts 13, um, Paul gives a gospel presentation to the Jews, but they all contain the same elements, and it is the person and work of Christ. It, it, it includes his Christhood, his deity, his death, and his resurrection. And if you believe that, those verses tell you in different ways that you have forgiveness of sins. Um, I believe in Romans 1, it says you have salvation, but that's how you get saved from the penalty of sin. But we have to continue believing sound doctrine and walking in obedience. We have to continue doing those two things to be saved from the presence of sin, to be saved from, you know, alcoholism or anger problems or succumbing to uh, false theology and all of these other things that can damage our soul and pollute us. And here in this case, it's saying, but she will be saved. And I don't think this is talking about from the penalty of sin. This is talking about from the uh, power of sin through the bearing of children. I think that's just a figure of speech for saying she will be saved by being feminine or remaining in a feminine defined sphere in addition to that if they should continue in belief and devotion and holiness with sound thinking. So if a woman rejects this doctrine, if they say, no, I think women have a right to be a pastor and they try to undermine that or force their way into that office, this text is saying, they will experience some kind of destruction. They'll be damaged. They won't be saved from some kind of spiritual damage if they, if they do that. Okay. And one more verse I want to look at that I think is very key and relevant to the passage we're looking at. I'm already at 30 minutes. My goodness. Okay, go to 1 Corinthians Chapter 5. Maybe I'll just make this a longer teaching, actually. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm really looking at the whole chapter here, but I'm going to like go through it quickly. But if you just want to read through the whole chapter on your own, this is the section where Paul is saying, hey, there's someone in the Corinthian church who's sleeping with their mother-in-law, I believe it is, which is like forbidden and disgusting. And, and then Paul ultimately says, you should kick this person out of the church. But what I want to show you is this person is a believer. Um, this is such a, such a common error uh, today. And I don't have time to get into all the details of it. But very often, um, what a lot of modern Christians do is they believe that the New Testament letters are written to a mixed audience. So they think at Corinth, for example, there's believers and non-believers. There's true Christians and fake Christians mixed in. And the fake ones are the ones in sin, and the true Christians are not walking in sin. But that you really, really have to eisegete Scripture to come to that conclusion. Eisegete just means you read it into the text rather than exegete, which means you go into the, into the text and flow out of it. But if you just read the first verses of the book of 1 Corinthians, it's so obvious that Paul believes the Corinthians are truly sanctified believers. 
So, and, and if you just read through 1 Corinthians and you just, again, if you just look for it, like he calls them in Christ, like like babes in Christ and things like that. In Christ is something you would only ever say of someone who's truly saved and going to heaven. And all the letters of the New Testament are like that. Um, if you just if you just read who the audience is and read the way they talk about the audience, even if the audience is sinning, even if they're in sin, the way the letters talk about them, it's very obvious the writer thinks they're believers. And I believe um, that idea that the letters are written to a mixed audience, I think that idea flows out of a common um, hermeneutical error where we take our modern day experience and impose it onto the biblical text. Like today we may have that situation. Today we have denominations that have mixed believers and non-believers, but that isn't the case for these letters. So the person here in 1 Corinthians 5, though committing this very immoral thing, is a genuine believer. So in 1 Corinthians 5, 1, it says, it is actually heard that there is fornication among you in such fornication, which isn't even named among the nations, so as for someone to be having the wife of his father. Now, if you read down to verse 9, read verse 9 with me. It says, I wrote to you in the letter not to be mingling with fornicators, and I didn't mean altogether with the fornicators of this world or with the greedy or with robbers or with idolaters. Since then, you are being obligated to go out of the world. But now I wrote to you not to mingle with anyone being named a brother if he should be a fornicator or a greedy person, or an idolater, or a reviler, or a drunkard, or a robber, not even to eat with such. So what Paul is saying here is, we have what's called in Christianity the doctrine of separation, that we're to, we're to separate um, from certain individuals in certain cases. And I think you can really go wrong with this doctrine. I think a lot of Christians go overkill with it. But it does exist in the Bible. And so here in this case, Paul says, when I said don't mingle with fornicators, I'm not talking about non-believers. I'm talking about believers. If Paul thought this guy was an unbeliever, he would have been fine with believers mingling with him. But he tells them to kick him out of the church, to, to judge him. Um, in a biblical sense, in a good sense of the word judge, not the pharisaical kind. But the fact that Paul says to do this, to kick him out, it means Paul thinks this guy's a believer. Now, I make that point because I want you to read verse 5. So go to 1 Corinthians 5.5. 5. You are to hand over such a one to Satan for destruction of the flesh so that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So here is another example where we see this is someone who is saved already from the penalty of sin, but he is not saved in this other sense. He's not saved in this secondary sense. Now, it makes reference to the day of the Lord Jesus. Whenever you see that phrase, the day of Christ, or the day of the Lord, or the day of Yahweh, or sometimes it's just called the day, it very often, if not always, refers to the second coming of Christ the physical, bodily return of Jesus Christ to this planet. And don't worry about missing it. You'll, it's impossible to miss. Um, it's described as like all the stars and the moon and the sun, like they stop giving light, like everything goes pitch black. And then it says 
uh, I think this is Matthew 24, but it says like from one part of the sky to the other is like lightning, like everyone will see it. And then it says Jesus comes back with a bunch of angels. So um, you never have to worry about a secret second coming of Christ. Um, you'll, you'll know that it's happening. But at the second coming of Christ, a ton of things happen. But one of the things that happens right after the second coming of Christ is what is called the judgment seat of Christ. In Greek, it's called the Bema. And it is a time when believers and only believers are assessed. They're assessed for how they live their lives post-conversion. And contrary to pretty mainstream uh, Christian thought, it is possible for a real believer to do poorly post-conversion. And the Bema will reveal that or expose that. And it is a, it's a time that's pretty uncomfortable. I think a lot of believers will, um, well, I don't know if I want to say a lot, but I will say there are believers who will happily go through the Bema. It'll be good for them because they're going to be rewarded. But there are going to be believers who are ashamed at the Bema. That's what it says in 1 John, that we would not be ashamed at his coming. I think it's possible to experience a lot of um, regret and embarrassment at the Bema. And I don't think it's a punitive time. I don't think it's a time when Jesus is going to judicially punish us for our sins. All of that was taken care of at the cross, taken care of at the cross. But it is a time when he still judges believers. Now, having said all of that, and that took so much longer to explain than I thought it would, um, why don't we go to Matthew 16? The reason I wanted to lay all that groundwork was I wanna, wanted to show you that there is um, biblical precedent with this terminology to say that this is not a, an evangelical passage. This is not a gospel presentation. This is not what you should say to a non-believer. It's something you say to a believer, to a disciple, someone who's I'm interested in following the Lord. I want to try to obey the commands of God, which is what every believer should be about and what we should be teaching every believer, according to the last verses of uh, the book of Matthew, right? We want to make disciples. We don't want to just make believers. We want to make students, and part of that is teaching them to observe all that Jesus commanded. Well, as we go into this passage, it will talk about the destruction of the soul and the saving of the soul, but I don't think it's talking about what we call eternal salvation. It's not that first tense of salvation, it's the second tense of salvation, where we need to be saved from the um, power of sin, the damaging effects of sin, the natural consequences of sin, or to use the term in Galatians 5, we need to be saved from the corruption that comes from the flesh. And if we are not saved from it, if, if we do not experience this, what happens is at the Bema, at the second coming of Christ, we experience a destruction there. It's an uncomfortable, it's an, it's an embarrassing, it's a, you know, it's a time where you kind of go, this, this hurts. This is rough to go through. And so uh, salvation in this context, I think, is not talking about eternal salvation. But in Matthew 16 and verse 24, after all that groundwork, then Jesus said to his students, if anyone is wanting to come behind me, and that means um, you want to follow Jesus and obey his commandments, and it's kind of like um, you want to become like him. 
I think we talked about the word student before. There's a verse in the Bible that says, and a student, when he's fully done with his studenthood, becomes like his master. So we're studying under Jesus with the hope and intention of becoming like him. So we want to think the way he thinks. We want to adopt his philosophies. We want to perceive humans the way he does. We want to perceive God the way he does. We want to um, make decisions the way he makes decisions. We want to have the same moral standards that Jesus has. And so on and so forth. Well, he says, if you want to do that, if you want to come behind me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and be following me. So it's kind of like, hey, you want to follow me? You can follow me, but you got to take up your cross and deny yourself and follow me. Now, taking up your cross is a pretty like visceral idea. You know, if like at the time, that was kind of like a gut punch shock statement, you know, that's like something you would say in a speech for like shock value almost. That That's kind of like today, like strap yourself to the electric chair and turn up the voltage, you know, go, go find some FBI torture chamber thing and like just strap yourself in and put on the head, the, the hood and do, go, go, what, what what was the torture thing they talked waterboarding go waterboard yourself so that's kind of what jesus is saying here pick up your cross cross was a an instrument of torture at this time and it was very gruesome it was it was way way overkill i mean killing is overkill but this was like way the way the way overkill um it was brutally torture and so when he says, take up your cross, that's like, that's like heavy. That's a, that's a, that's a very, very painful thing. And then deny yourself. So that means denying, it can, it can mean a lot of things, but it means like denying what you want out of life. Like, I want to spend my 30s doing this, or I want to spend my 20s doing this, or I want to live in this kind of house. I want to have this kind of career. I want to go travel the world. I want to start a business. I want to relax for the rest of my life. Whatever it is you want, you're going to have to deny yourself. I really want to have these beliefs. I really want to have these practices. I really want money. I really want health. Um, I want more time to myself. Whatever it is you want, when you become a disciple of Jesus, you have to understand you're going to have to deny yourself. Like you can, you can look into your soul and say, oh, I really want this, but I'm going to deny that to me. I'm going to deny myself. And so um, what Jesus is saying here is being a disciple is going to require a lot. It is may not require a lot right away and it may not require a lot all the time like you, you may you may not see immediate consequences to being a disciple of Jesus although I think they come pretty pretty early uh, you may not you may not put it together right away or maybe you're not in a situation where you're having to obey a command and it will be costly to you yet. But sooner or later, you're going to be in a position where, oh, to obey Jesus, it's going to hurt. And that's kind of the idea here. It's kind of like obey Jesus till it hurts. Be Obey Jesus to the point where you choose him over yourself. Like, if Jesus has an opinion about divorce and you have a different one, you have to deny your own opinion. You have to say, I'm wrong, he's right. Or if Jesus says, give to everyone who asks of you, and someone's asking you for money, and you're like, I really don't want to give this person money, 
you have to deny yourself and say, I'm, I'm going to give this person money. Um, if Jesus says, if someone hits you, don't hit them back. And someone hits you, you have to deny and you really want to, you know, fight back. You can, you can handle this person. It's a matter of pride. You look bad because someone punched you and you look like a wimp by not punching back. You have to deny yourself. You have to say, I'm not going to do what I want to do because Jesus told, told me to do this other thing. Or when Jesus says, um, there's a hell and I don't want to believe in a hell because it makes me look bad and, and I don't even want to believe in hell. Well, we have to deny ourselves. Well, Jesus said it, so it's true. And if other people don't like us for that, pick up your cross and deny yourself. Like, just take the heat. Just, just let them hate you. Just let them talk bad about you. Yeah, I'm a bigot. I'm closed-minded. I'm, I'm whatever. Sure. That That's like a smaller version of the crucifixion. Obviously, the crucifixion was um, much more brutal. That, that was a much higher uh, cross, you might say. We kind of have these like smaller crosses to bear. But they are our own. And I think to an extent they are unique. I think each person will have certain things in their life, um, right? You might you might have a child who is just really going down a bad path in life, and maybe another Christian doesn't have that situation. Well, in this situation, this might be you know quote unquote as they say a cross to bear. Or maybe you have the other situation. Maybe, um, maybe you have a parent who is just really difficult, and you know the and you know the Bible says to honor your mother and father, and you know this person is hurting you, and it's difficult, and it's like I, I don't know what to do here. Um, but not every Christian has that situation, or uh, the situation I mentioned earlier, where certain um, churches in the world just deal with m more physical persecutions. Like the situation I'm in, I don't really deal with physical persecution. I deal with verbal persecution, but in a in a place like North Korea or a lot of the countries in the Middle East, um, it's probably a lot worse and more dangerous for them to do what I'm doing right now, just meeting and, t and teaching the Bible um, or even just listening to the Bible. So there are these crosses to bear that we have. Um, there are certain commandments that Jesus gives us that, oh, if I obey this, it's going to hurt and I don't want to do it. And Jesus is saying, do it anyway. Like, go through the pain to obey me. And then he says, why? Why? And you might be like initially discouraged. You might be tempted to say, I don't know if it's worth it. Well, it is worth it. And Jesus says so in verse 25, for whoever wants to save his soul will destroy it. But whoever destroys his soul for my sake will find it. And I think here is what Jesus is saying. If you try to preserve your soul by disobeying Jesus, at the Bema, you're going to be destroyed. If you, if you want to spare yourself from being verbally abused by someone, or if you want to spare yourself from losing a friend by disobeying Jesus, you're trying to save your soul. And Jesus says, that might feel good for now. It, it's a temporary effect. It's a temporary benefit because later on, your soul's going to be destroyed. 
We have an example of this in Mark chapter 8. So this is a parallel passage. It's the same context, but Mark actually provides an example of what Jesus is talking about. In Mark chapter 8 and verse 38, so these are the same verses that we just read. And then it says, For whoever might be embarrassed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man also will be embarrassed at him when he should come in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. So, if you're embarrassed to be associated with Christ, if you're embarrassed to be a Christian, if you're embarrassed of the words of Christ, well, Christ says, um, no one comes to the Father except through me. He's the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way to go to heaven except through Jesus. If you're embarrassed about that, if there's people that are saying, well, that's ignorant, that's closed-minded, that's ridiculous, there's so many other religions. Um, I just ran into someone recently. Um, I just went out um, evangelizing with a really wonderful brother, and we talked to a Muslim, and the way the he did, he was very um, reluctant to believe in the deity of Christ um, or the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. And at the end, he says, "Well, there's many ways to the top of a mountain, right?" And the idea is, you know, all these different religions or paths or ways of living life—they're all going up to God and into heaven. Well, Jesus contradicts that. Jesus says, no one comes to the Father except through me. So if you don't go through Jesus, you're never seeing the Father. And Jesus actually says that in a couple of different ways, right? I am the door. Anyone who goes in a different way is a thief and a robber. I am the door. Now, if you're embarrassed about that, if, if you like, well, okay, maybe there's other ways to heaven. Uh, you know, yeah, Jesus is a little a product of his time, and that's not, yeah, he went over, he's a fundamentalist. If you're embarrassed of his words, you're going to feel a temporary period of time where people people are like, oh, okay, maybe you're not that bad. Maybe you're not one of those crazy Christians, and maybe we can still hang out and People still like your stuff on social media. You're, you're not rejected. You're not an outcast of society, or maybe you're a lesser outcast. And maybe you feel good about yourself. You know, you pat yourself on the back, and you're not one of those crazy Christians. You're not one of those judgmental, pharisaical, fire and brimstone Christians. But if you're embarrassed of the words of Jesus Christ and you experience that temporary saving of your soul, at the second coming, when the Son of Man comes into the comes in his glory with his angels and the Bema happens, he's gonna be embarrassed with you. You know, he's gonna be like, This is one of those people I died for, and they believed in me, and they and I saved them. But, oh, you know, it, it it's kind of like I don't know. Maybe it's like one of those times. Like, if, I'm trying to think of an example. Like when a if if, a, if there's a married couple and one of them's embarrassed of the other in a public situation, but then they go home and it's just kind of like that really hurt my feelings that you were so embarrassed about me. And then you realize the person who was embarrassed. You realize like, oh, it's embarrassing that I was embarrassed. Like I shouldn't have been embarrassed. That's embarrassing. So that's the idea. That's the example in Mark 8.38. And it's this exact passage, parallel um, passage to Matthew 16. That's you're saving your soul now, but you're destroying it later. But the opposite is true. If you destroy your soul now, you will save it later. That's what it says in, in Matthew 16. Remember, Jesus says, For whoever wants to save his soul will destroy it. We talked about that. But whoever destroys his soul for my sake will find it. All right, two quick notes, just so we're all on the same page. If you look at the 
parallel passages to this one, which is Mark 8, 34 to 38, and Luke 9, 23 to 26. Um, I already did all the work already. If you want to check it out, you can. The word destroy and lose are parallel. So destroy your soul is the same thing as losing your soul. And saving your soul is the same thing as finding your soul. So if you see the word save, it's the same thing as find in this context. Same thing with destroy and lose. Um, the second thing I want to note about this is keep in mind we're talking about destroying your soul for the sake of Christ. And the book of Mark says for the sake of Christ and that of the good message. So it's kind of like the person of Christ, but also all those teachings that flow out of him, right? The gospel that saves all of his words. Don't be ashamed of any of his words, all the doctrine that he teaches, which for us would be the totality of the Bible, the word of God. And the point I'm trying to make is there are many people who destroy themselves, but they destroy themselves for the wrong reasons. And the book of 1 Peter says, if you suffer as a sinner, what benefit is that to you? So there's people who suffer for their sins and they stick with it, you know. Um, they're committed to abusing drugs or they're committed to some kind of sexual sin and or they're committed to you know, avoiding their taxes or rebelling against the government. They're like, I'm going to stick with this and I'm going to suffer for it. Well, it's, you're going to suffer for it, but there's no, like the benefits don't weigh out the suffering. It's even more shameful that you're willing to suffer to do these things. But if you suffer as a Christian, First Peter says, well, well, that's a good thing, right? The Holy Spirit has come upon you. Um, here it says, if you destroy yourself for the sake of Christ, you will save yourself. So we're not, we're not talking about destroying yourself to make money or have a career. It's not a, you're destroying yourself for some kind of selfish ambition. I'm trying to get internet famous. I'm going to move to some place where I can meet a bunch of people and network and make it in the music industry or the movie industry and become famous. And, you know, we're not talking about destroying yourself for some kind of selfish ambition. We're not talking about destroying yourself for um, a political cause or for your nation or joining the military and, you know, dedicating and committing your life for a political party or something like that. Um, we're not talking about destroying yourself for your nuclear family. I think sometimes that can be part of destroying yourself for Christ because the Christ does have commandments um, regarding family life. But it's not that. You know, it's, it's destroying yourself for Christ. That's the, that's the thing that will save your soul or you'll find your soul later on again at the Bema. And that's always the context, right? If you read all those parallel passages, including the one here in Matthew 16, it's talking about um, saving yourself when the Son of Man comes in his glory. So you need, you need to look past this life that you're in. You have to look past, you know, retirement. You need to look into the distant future and remember, okay, there's going to be a second coming of Christ at which point I'll receive my glorified body and I'm going to be judged and assessed by Christ for how I lived my life. And so at that Bema, it's going to be comfortable or uncomfortable. It's going to be a time of joy or a time of regret. I'm going to get rewarded or I'm not going to get rewarded. I'm going to have confidence or I'm going to be ashamed. It's the language in 1 John. And here the language is you're going to feel a destruction here. Or if you remember in 1 Corinthians 5.5, 5, if you destroy the flesh now, 
you will be saved in that day, uh, the day of the Lord Jesus. So when we have a command from Jesus, and it's going to hurt to obey it, we're going to feel a destruction right now, but it is a temporary one. It hurts when people call us homophobic, even though the clear teaching of Scripture is that homosexuality is a sin. Um, and they slander us for it, right? Like, ah, oh, you guys are, you know, so unforgiving. Well, I think you've been fed a false narrative. I'm sure some Christians are like that. But that combination of you're evil and you're also evil because you do this other sin. Not only do you um, think there's something wrong with homosexuality, but you even hate their guts and stuff like that. Um, it hurts when people say we're so unscientific. I can't believe you guys only think the earth is a couple thousand years old. And, and oh my gosh, the things people have said to me. Like, one, one time I was talking to a guy who he accused me of saying dinosaurs never existed. And he was like really belittlingly, belittling me and making fun of me. He's like, oh, let me guess, Satan buried all those dinosaur bones. And I was really confused because I've always believed in dinosaurs. And I've never even heard of Christians who didn't believe in the existence of dinosaurs. The Bible mentions dinosaurs. So I don't know what he heard, but either way, I looked like a total idiot, even though I don't think I was wrong. And that's the sort of thing that happens. You get accused. Your, your reputation starts to be destroyed. People start slandering you. Um, this is mentioned in, in Matthew 5, right? Um, blessed are you when you're persecuted. And it's not physical persecution that's mentioned here, right? It says, blessed are you whenever they lying may reproach you and persecute and say every evil word against you because of me. But then it says, be rejoicing and be glad because your reward is great in the heavens. And we get those rewards at the Bema. So the more we get hated, the more people spread rumors about us, the more people attack us, the higher our bank account goes at the Bema. And so we get, we're supposed to be happy about that. But it hurts, right? There's that destruction. It, you know, it hurts when people, um, what else have people like slandered me over or all kinds of like, oh, uh, the complimentary view of men and women. Um, if you have a, a view of men and women where you say these are two genders who are equally made in the image of God and of equal worth, but we recognize that there's functional differences between these two. Oh my gosh, the stuff, people, you will be reproached, okay? You will be reproached. Um, I, I'm sure there's others. I can't think of them off the top of my head. And, and I haven't even gotten it that bad. I mean, there's people who have gotten it way, way, way worse. Um, but those are just examples of um, destruction, right? When you obey the word of God or you're, um, you're not ashamed of the words of Christ or Christ himself. And I've done it. I, there's been times when I'm like embarrassed or I've shrunk away and I shouldn't have and it was wrong for me to do that. But these passages of Scripture are the ones that help me overcome that. These are, the, these are the Scriptures where I go, oh, I'm supposed to not shrink back when there's pressure to be embarrassed about the Word of God. Um, I'm, I'm kind of supposed to hurt as a Christian. You know, I, I shouldn't be shocked when people think evil things of me. Um, so these verses tell us you're going to experience destruction of your soul as you obey Jesus. But what you need to do is endure it. Just take the heat and cast your eyes into the distant future. 
Like imagine years and years and years from now, hopefully days from now, but I don't think he's coming back in a couple of days. I could be wrong. But in the distant future when Christ returns, imagine standing before him and saying, you are one of the fewest Christians in 21st century America who stuck with my view on homosexuality. And all these other peoples wavered and caved, and some of them even turned around and attacked you and joined the crowd, the, the hate mob, and tried to attack you for it. I'm going to reward you for that because that took guts and that was hard to go through and good for you. That's the kind of stuff that happens at the Bema. So the pain you feel for following Christ now, that cross you're carrying right now, and you can tell, oh, this hurts because I'm obeying the word of God. Keep doing it, and the way you endure it, the way you can get through it is almost taking your eyes off of it and looking at the Bema and knowing I'm going to be saved later on. This this is going to feel so good once this is all said and done. So that's what this is talking about. Destroy yourself now but be saved later on. Hurt now, be happy later. All right, let's go back to Matthew 16, and I'm wondering if there's anything else I wanted to say. Verse 26, For what will a man be profited if he gains the whole world but loses his soul? Again, remember, loses is con compared to destroying his soul. Or what will a man give as a trade for his soul? And... Um, the idea is, you know, even, even if you wanted to play this game where I'm going to follow Jesus as much as I can without getting hurt, even if you wanted to play that game, and if you want to get all the advantages of the world and get all the advantages of Christ at the same time and not suffer consequences of both, which is impossible, by the way, even if you wanted to do that, it's like, yeah, but at what cost? Like, who who cares if you gain everything the world has to offer? Um, fame or money or approval or people think you're a re you're a very res oh you're one of those respectable Christians you know we'll quote you in our sources or whatever blessing or benefit you get from the world. What does it matter if you gain? All of that. You play the game and you get all of this approval from the world. What does it really matter when you're at the Bema? Like, doesn't Christ know everything? Isn't he going to know your motivations? Isn't he going to know, like, well, you actually weren't devoted to me, right? It's not worth it. That, like, that's what Jesus is trying to say. It's like, it's not worth it to avoid suffering for Christ. It hurts, and we don't want to suffer, but Jesus is saying it's not worth it to avoid it. It's not worth caving to the fear of man. It's not worth um, throwing in the towel of like, you know, I'm, I'm just done being long long suffering for this person. Galatians says, we will reap a harvest if we do not grow weary. Like keep keep going because there's great reward for it. It's just not worth it. Verse 27, for, and here's the reason, the Son of Man, that's a title for Messiah, is about to be coming in the glory of his Father with his messengers. That's the second coming of Christ. That's when Jesus comes to the earth with all his angels in glory. So he's not going to be in veiled glory like he was in his first coming, where people couldn't really see that he had the same glory as the Father. Um, everyone's going to see him and know, okay, that guy's God. He's going to come in his glory with all his angels, set up his kingdom. He's about to do that. 
and he will re recompense each according to his practice. So the things we practice, the things we do regularly, uh, maybe even things like the, th the things we try to do or put our effort into doing, he's going to repay us according to those practices. And whether good or bad, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 or 5, I believe, it says that. So this is talking about the Bema. And so this is why, do you see the connection with the word for? This is why we destroy our souls now for the sake of Christ. It's because, it's not because we'll receive some kind of blessing in this lifetime, although we may. It's saying at the second coming of Christ, when Jesus looks at how we lived our lives, he's going to look at all the believers of all time, Martin Luther and that nobody believer that no one that, that history forgot about who lived in Russia or India or whatever. He's going to look at all the believers of all time and he's going to say you get this, you get this, you don't get this. You and we will have those rewards and recognition forever. So that's the motivation. So we suffer now for the reward later. We destroy our souls, ourselves now for salvation later. That's what he's talking about here. And let me read verse 28 because it's part of his speech here, but I'm going to deal with this verse in the next teaching. But right after that, this, he says in verse 28, Amen, I am saying to you, there are some standing here who shall certainly not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So Jesus is saying, there's a few people who's, li who's listening to this right now. They're going to see me, the Son of Man, come into my kingdom before they physically die. And a lot of people have stumbled over this verse, like, oh, Jesus is saying, his second coming will happen in the lives of the apostles, and it didn't. So Jesus must have been wrong. Jesus was lying, which like doesn't even make sense because Matthew wrote this book after the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. Anyway, um, and, and then there's a few other people who say Jesus did fulfill this and like set up his kingdom on earth, and, and the Son of Man came into his kingdom at his first coming, um, which I don't think is exactly what happened. So they kind of think the kingdom of God was like a spiritual thing that's happened and we're in the kingdom of God right now. Um, all of that to say is I have a different interpretation for it. And I'll explain it in the next teaching. But the short story is I think this gets fulfilled in the following chapter, Matthew chapter 17, on the Mount of Transfiguration. All right, friends, we're going to complete this teaching. The short lesson here is obey Jesus even if it hurts. It's worth it. I know it hurts, but it's worth it. All right, grace and peace to you.